Hello everyone and welcome to A Story of Light, a live stream musical journey in 19 days. Today is day six and if this is your first time watching you're very welcome. Thanks everyone for tuning in. My name is Luke Slot. I'm a musician in Dublin and I mainly focus on setting to music the Baha'i sacred writings and for the first 19 days of March I'm doing this series of daily live streams for um, uh, about 15-20 minutes a day with some storytelling and a live song at the end. And this is all in preparation for the release of my new album, Home of Light, which is coming out later this year, and which is a collection of new songs based on the writings of Abdul Baha. And if you're not familiar with Abdul Baha, he was the son of Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i Faith, and he's really cherished as a role model to Baha'is and friends around the world. And 2021 is the 100th anniversary of his passing. So it's a very special year and um, hence the, the new album coming out in his honor. So uh, feel free to check out the previous episodes. They're linked uh, in the description below. Um, I'm creating a playlist as, as, uh, as we do the streams so that you can watch the, the, the episodes in your own time if you like. So today is the sixth day of the annual Baha'i Fast, a very special time of year when we just try to refocus our minds and recenter ourselves and, and focus on the, the important things in life. And this is uh, episode six of uh, A Story of Light. So yesterday's episode became a, almost like a kind of introduction to some members of Baha'u'llah's family, uh, specifically his wife, Nawab, his son, Abdul Baha, and his daughter, Bahia Khanum. And Baha'u'llah and Nawab actually also had a little baby boy whose name was Mirza Mehdi. And kind of heartbreakingly, at the time when, when they were banished from Persia to Baghdad, they actually had to leave Mirza Mehdi behind in the care of Nawab's mother because the journey that they were being forced to take uh, with severely inadequate provisions and in the, the depths of an extremely cold winter it would have been too dangerous for a baby and he wouldn't have survived. And so they had to leave him behind in Tehran and make arrangements for him to join them in Baghdad when he was a few years older. And so Baghdad was an interesting place uh, for them to, 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 to try and rebuild their lives. Baghdad had, at a certain point in its history, it had, uh, it had really been this very vibrant center of culture and the arts and uh, philosophy and scientific advancement. But in the 19th century, it had kind of fallen into a state of decline and it had lost that vibrancy. And it was, this was largely due to the mismanagement of its ruler, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, a, a, an empire that was really one of the biggest empires in the history of the world, but which was also known for its, uh, for the, the, the excessive opulence of its rulers, its, uh, its political corruption, and, uh, and its terrible mismanagement of its cities, Baghdad included. But at least it was a place where Baha'u'llah where Baha and Nawab could, could start to rebuild their lives. And of course, naturally, when they arrived in Baghdad, the first thing that Nawab wanted to do was to nurse Baha'u'llah back to health after all the strain of his imprisonment in the Black Pit, followed by uh, the, the, this, the rigours of this forced exile. And uh, even though outwardly, Baha'u'llah was of course terribly weakened. Uh, his body had just been traumatised by the whole ordeal. But his family couldn't help notice that there was something beyond his physical appearance that seemed to be like shining from him, almost like a light that was emanating from him. Baha'u'llah had, had told his family nothing of the, the mystical experience that he had had down in the black pit when he had seen the maid of heaven. Uh, in fact, he had told nobody. And yet his family started to notice that ever since his release from prison, there was this radiance that was emanating from him, in, in, invisible to the eye, but undeniable when they were in his presence. And his daughter, Bahia Khanum, wrote about this. So, Atmo, can you just put up the next, the first slide, please? 
So Bahia Khanum said, We saw a new radiance seeming to enfold him like a shining vesture, its significance we were to learn years later. At that time, we were only aware of the wonder of it, without understanding or even being told the details of the sacred event. And there was a wisdom in in Baha'u'llah keeping his revelation secret for the time being, that the intensity of, of what he had witnessed, uh, what he had experienced in his vision of that of the maid of heaven, it would have been too much for the people to bear. It would have been too much. It would have been almost as if the sun in the early hours of the morning suddenly just appeared in the middle of the sky. It would have been too bright, too dazzling, too much to handle. Baha'u'llah had to gradually prepare the people for that moment, for all that the Bab had done, there was still work to do. And so, having regained his strength, Baha'u'llah set about gradually preparing his fellow Babis for the next stage of their calling. But of course, this radiance that surrounded Baha'u'llah was, was inevitably noticed by the people in his neighborhood, in the marketplace, in the, the coffee shops where he would socialize. And soon enough, reports of this radiant, energetic man in Baghdad who was making efforts to revive the cause of the Bab reached all the way back to Persia, where scattered around the country were little groups of Babis many of them now hiding in fear of the ongoing persecution. And those Babis began setting out in droves, travelling across the mountains from Persia to Baghdad to meet this person whose name was now on all their lips, Baha'u'llah. And when they met him, their hopes were revived. Baha'u'llah seemed to have a way of restoring that sense of courage and dignity and self-respect that the, that the Bab had so powerfully infused into them. And soon enough, there were hundreds of Babis making the journey across the mountains to Baghdad. And among those Babis who made that journey was Baha'u'llah's own younger brother, whose name was Mirza Yahya. And Mirza Yahya was about 13 years younger than Baha'u'llah, and after their father had passed away, Baha'u'llah had really become like a father figure to Mirza Yahya. He had raised him, he had educated him, uh, he had even introduced him to the message of the Bab. And one day, Mirza Yahya showed up in disguise at Baha'u'llah and Nawab's door, demanding that they take him in and protect him from the persecution he was facing back in Persia. And of course, Baha'u'llah and Nawab took Mirza Yahya in and gave him everything that he needed to settle into life in Baghdad. But from the moment he arrived, a whole new set of troubles began. Mirza Yahya saw the prestige and the respect that his brother was receiving and he wanted a piece of it. And jealous thoughts, like little drops of poison, started to ferment in Mirza Yahya's mind, and he became consumed with this overpowering desire to ruin his brother's efforts and make himself the leader of the Babis. And so, with a little gossip over here, a little slander over there, a few strategically placed negative words in the ears of Baha'u'llah's friends, Mirza Yahya launched a tactical campaign to destroy his brother's reputation. So, Antimo, can you put up the next slide, please? Shoghi Effendi tells us, A clandestine opposition, whose aim was to nullify every effort exerted and frustrate every design conceived by Baha'u'llah for the rehabilitation of a distracted community could now be clearly discerned. Insinuations whose purpose was to sow the seeds of doubt and suspicion and to represent Baha'u'llah as a usurper, as the subverter of the laws instituted by the Bab and the wrecker of his cause, 
were being incessantly circulated. And Mirza Yahya began to distort the teachings of the Bab, twisting them and warping them into whatever shape would serve his purposes. And these Babis, who just years previously had become the most outstanding heroes and saints of their time, these same people, just in terms of basic human decency, went from being the creme de la creme to the worst of the worst. Under the influence of Mirza Yahya, they became thieves, they became liars, they even became murderers. And all the energy that Baha'u'llah was putting into unifying and uplifting his fellow Babis was now being used to turn them against him. Mirza Yahya was using Baha'u'llah's own presence in Baghdad as a lever to pit the Babis against each other. And the more he pushed that lever, the more they fought amongst themselves. And Baha'u'llah watched his fellow Babis tear themselves apart. So, Antimo, can you put up the next slide, please? Shoghi Effendi tells us, The cup of Baha'u'llah's sorrows was now running over. All his exhortations, all his efforts to remedy a rapidly deteriorating situation had remained fruitless. The velocity of his manifold woes was hourly and visibly increasing. And so the more effort that Baha'u'llah made to help his fellow Babis, the fiercer became his brother's attacks. And he knew that if he stayed among them much longer, Mirza Yahya would split the Babis into competing factions and the community would be shattered forever. And one morning, just a year after they had arrived in Baghdad, Nawab and the children woke up to find that Baha'u'llah had disappeared without a trace. And so for today's song, I'd like to sing for you some words of Baha'u'llah on the theme of love and patience and fortitude in times of trials. So if you're fasting today, I hope you have a good fast. Uh, I really, really am so grateful that you're joining me for these live streams. It's a privilege to tell these stories. And I hope that you will uh, join me tomorrow for day seven of A Story of Light. This song is called The Sign of Love. Son of man, for everything there is a There 
there is a sign The sign of love is fortitude The sign of love Under my decree